Before we begin today's video, I'd just like to remind folks that I have a Twitch channel. I usually stream live Q&As, quizzes, let's plays, and much more. So feel free to follow me on Twitch to be notified about every single stream I do. Howdy folks, Jabberiki here. In today's episode of Puppet Panic, things are going to get very nostalgic for my British viewers. I'm going to be taking you all back in time to talk about classic TV shows that utilize puppetry. Now, keep in mind that the UK has produced many, 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 many puppet TV series, so I can't talk about all of them. If I did, then this video would be about seven hours long. With that in mind, if one of your favorite puppet shows doesn't get mentioned in this video, please don't take it personally, and please don't assume that I missed it. This also won't be the last time I'll be covering this topic, so don't worry. Okay, let's get the video going already! <laughs> Rosie and Jim. Set on a canal narrowboat in the Midlands, Rosie and Jim is about two ragdolls who can magically turn to life and try to keep their sentience a secret from their boat owner, all while learning about the world outside their boat. This show holds a special place in my childhood. You see, growing up, my auntie lived in Stratford-upon-Avon, the filming location for Rosie and Jim. I have fond memories of visiting her. We'd walk down the canal, meet friendly boat owners. Sometimes I was allowed to open the canal gate while supervised, and then we would all go to the Rosie and Jim Museum. It was quite strange to revisit the show as an adult, because it's not what I remember it being. I was just expecting the adventures of two cute and innocent ragdolls. But Rosie and Jim are a lot more anarchic than I remember. Lots of nice flour. Making a trail, Jim, come on. One <laughs> left. That's our trail, Jim. <laughs> Oi, you lot, this is the way. They're like beavers and butthead as puppets. No, really. They constantly snicker at nothing, turn everything they see into a joke, and can be an inconvenience to others. You may be wondering if that's a good or bad thing. I mean, how can characters like this be ideal role models for kids? Well, as silly as they are, they often do have good intentions. It's just that they can't approach anything without any maturity at all. <laughs> Basically, they're the very definition of chaotic good. I guess what they can teach kids are the consequences of not thinking before doing something. Rosie and Jim will frequently try to help or support the boat owner, but they'll always end up going about it the wrong way, and the results are often quite messy. How on earth did that cake get there? Kids will really enjoy their cheeky antics, but I wouldn't blame parents for being disapproving of them. Because they're very mischievous, cause annoying problems for the harmless innocent boat owner, and don't really take accountability for their clumsy actions. Personally, I find these two to be hilarious. Maybe I'm just a juvenile person, but they really did remind me of a pair of teenage stoners. <laughs> Rosie, yeah. we've hap, hap, hap. to the hospital. <laughs> In terms of education, I think that the show does a decent job. Characters actually rarely turn to the camera to teach kids the lesson. Most of the learning comes from watching the characters simply experiencing new things firsthand. I have to admire the show for not simply spelling things out. That takes a lot of confidence in a young audience. Hello, Neil. Hello again. Let's have a look at your x-rays. These grey bits down the middle, they're the bones. They look all right to me, nothing broken. I suspect you've just got a very bad sprain. I think the main appeal of Rosie and Jim, though, is its relaxing setting. Watching a narrow boat flow down a canal is inherently calming to watch. The boat owner always looks happy where he is. The sights and sounds are peaceful, and the boat itself is always going at a slow, gentle pace. Rosie and Jim might not be for every family, because these two ragdolls have quite anarchic personalities, despite how cute they look. But I think kids will really like them and enjoy their explorative adventures. Rainbow. This show is about a family of puppets and humans living together in the same house, including Jeffrey, Zippy, George, and Bungle. 
Each episode would have the characters playing together while also learning new things. In UK culture, Rainbow is considered by many to be a cornerstone of children's television, and it's easy to see why. Many have labelled it as the British version of Sesame Street, and yeah, it's very easy to make that comparison, but Rainbow is still doing its own unique thing. There's a sweet charm to watching these characters simply hanging out as a family. The puppets represent inquisitive children for the target audience to relate to, while Jeffrey is the fatherly teacher figure always ready to explain and educate. Each puppet is also branded with a distinct personality that kids can apply to their siblings or friends. Zippy is the cheeky silly one, George is the shy quiet one, and Bungle is the mature well behaved one. It makes sense why children resonated deeply with the Rainbow House. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring, he went to bed and he bumped his head and he couldn't get up in the morning. <laughs> rain on the green grass, rain on the tree, rain on the house top, but not on me. <laughs> <laughs> raindrops, raindrops, falling from the sky, watering your garden when the ground is dry. I also have to say that, well, this is a really funny series. While its intention is to educate kids, it has this great sense of humour, almost like it's winking at the parents in the audience. I was taken back by how often its goofy comedy managed to make me laugh. What seems to be the problem? Well, I can't find my way home, I'm lost. Oh, lost? Mm. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, don't go talking to strangers. Try and find a policeman if you can. <laughs> But I have found a policeman! Oh, uh, say I'm sorry. Fun fact too, during rehearsals, the cast would perform more rude versions of a scene, and the cameraman actually filmed them for laughs. I'm not kidding, you can find the clips online. Do you want to blow my pipe while I'm twanging away? Oh no, Rod. I was blowing a lot with Roger last night. It doesn't matter what size your twanger is. <laughs> I've got a big red one. The show has this psychedelic aesthetic too. The puppets look strange. The sets have this surreal, colourful pop art design. There are weird animated transitions that appear randomly. And there are so, so many dream sequences. The trippiness of the show is one big reason why it stayed in so many people's memories. Rainbow really does deserve its timeless reputation, because it has so much colourful personality, educational value, and surreal imagination. I can confidently say that even kids of today would get a lot out of it. Thunderbirds. Created by the iconic Jerry Anderson, this marionette show focused on the adventures of International Rescue, a secret organisation hid away on the exotic Tracy Island. The popularity of this show mainly came from the five unique international rescue machines, each piloted by members of the Tracy family. Your typical Thunderbirds episode would open with a disaster or terrorist attack, then the Tracys would be called into action, and the best vehicle for the job would be launched into mission. Now, it's actually really amazing how a show like this became as successful as it did, and how it's become a touchstone of British children's television. I mean, every episode is almost an hour long, the dialogue is very dry and formal, the pacing can be quite slow, and there's more emphasis on authentic realism over punchy storytelling. I'm not saying that these are bad things, not at all, just that they're not exactly how you describe a TV show made for kids. It's quite impressive that something this sophisticated was not only targeted at kids, but also beloved by children too. Thunderbird 2, this is mobile control. Confirm estimated time of arrival, London Airport. Okay, Scott. Arriving in 19 and one half minutes from now. Now, as soon as you arrive, unload high-speed elevator car with two radio-controlled subsidiaries. Then proceed to end of runway 29 and report. Thunderbird 1, FAB. The phantom surrounding this show was huge and is still active today. It makes sense that most of the show's current fans are adults who grew up on the series, because I can't imagine today's kids having the patience for it. I say that as someone who grew up with this show as a child. Times have changed, that's all. Hence why the series was given a more modern and flashier CGI remake. While the show is very much of its time, it has held up really well. Mainly because Jerry Anderson approached every episode like a Hollywood movie. He treated his puppets like action film stars, and tried to replicate the production values of American blockbusters. Okay, I'll give you 10 seconds to throw your gun down and come out with your hands up. Gun, or the professor will be pushed in front of the express. There's an inherent charm to how Jerry Anderson used miniature sets, tiny props, and marionettes to tell the kind of stories you'd see in live action films through puppetry. 
The puppets themselves may have glazed over expressions. Yes, you can clearly see the strings. And of course, the crew obviously struggled with their limitations. But that's what's so endearing about Thunderbirds. A lot of effort and attention was put into creating the illusion of high production values. What's amazing too is that the show's special effects advisor, Derek Meddings, actually went on to work on the James Bond movies. All in all, Thunderbirds is a fun and ambitious puppet show that took risky ambitions and pushed the standards for what marionette television could do. The only thing that's not aged very well is the racist caricature villain. Yikes. Yeah, the hood is effectively intimidating and even sometimes funny in a campy way, but he's also an outdated Fu Manchu trope who could be considered as very offensive today. When does international rescue start operating? Speak, Kirano! Uh What's wrong, Kirano? Besides that, though, this is still a great TV show and a fantastic gateway into Jerry Anderson's puppet shows. So we're halfway through this video, and I'd just like to remind folks to consider subscribing to my channel. And if you're already subscribed, please don't forget to click the notification bell. Thank you. Bill and Ben, flower pot men. Bill and Ben are two small men who live in flower pots, and they have a neighbor called Little Weed the Flower. Each episode follows their cute adventures in an English garden. I can sum up flower pot men in just one word. Silly. It's very, very, very silly. And I mean that as a compliment. This show's appeal all stems from how lovably quirky these flower pot men are. Whoop. Dop. Whoop. Dop. Whoop. Dop. They find joy and entertainment in the tiniest of things. Always excited to play with anything in the garden. Which is very relatable for kids when you think about it. Kids love exploring their garden for fun, finding things to inspire their games or imagination. The most distinct thing about Flower Pot Men is that Bill and Ben speak in their own language called Oddle Poddle, which was invented by Doctor Who voice actor Peter Hawkins. Peter reads this made up language with both comedic energy and genuine enthusiasm. When they found out they'd been hiding from each other, they laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> I really love the puppetry for Bill and Ben too. The puppeteers completely embrace how floppy they are, which can make their movements and gestures instantly funny, syncing perfectly with Peter Hawkins' goofy voice acting. Now, some British adults have often complained that kid shows with limited or gibberish English are problematic because they don't teach children how to expand their vocabulary. But I think that's a very flawed criticism. Not every kid show needs to be educational. Sometimes it's okay for them to be just a bit of fun for children to relax to after school. And kids will love the eccentric way Bill and Ben talk. Oh, heap glob oip. Order not. Order boot. Oh. Oh, ho, 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 I think that there's also something deeply ableist about this criticism too, because not all British kids can speak fluent Queen's English. Some kids are on the autism spectrum and can only communicate through emotional noises or have selective mutism. You can really tell that this criticism came from neurotypicals. Bill and Ben can be seen as great role models for autistic children, because they have their own way of talking and the narrator accepts it as normal. To me, that's a beautiful way of looking at this TV series that makes it more than just a silly show about marionette flower pot men. Oh, and yes, I know about Cosgrove Hall's reboot of Bill and Ben, but that was done with stop motion, so I don't consider it relevant to this video. Sooty and Co. Sooty is a teddy bear puppet who first appeared in The Sooty Show, a variety comedy series hosted by Harry Corbett. After Harry retired in 1975, his son Matthew, who was a singer on Rainbow, took over the series as its new presenter. In the 90s, Sooty was reinvented as a sitcom set in an antique shop called Sooty and Co, which followed Matthew, Sooty, Sweep, Sue, and Little Scampy, as they tried to keep their business going. Each generation has their own version of Sooty. This one was mine. Well, one of them. I remember watching it every school day morning. Revisiting Sooty & Co as an adult, I have to say that it's held up quite well. I think the endearing quality of the series is its relatability. The antique shop is always facing money trouble or household problems. Plus, Matthew and the puppets often have communication misunderstandings. Kids will find humor and entertainment from all the comedic calamities our characters face while parents can immediately resonate with Matthew's financial burdens and career obstacles. There's something for the whole family here. What's that? What? What's this? That's water! 
Oh, no, look at that. Honestly, the plumbing in this house is absolutely terrible. The comedy is very much for preschoolers, but Matthew and the puppets pull off every joke and gag with pretty decent timing. I did find myself laughing quite a lot, more often than I thought I would. Which is quite a compliment for a comedy show not targeted at me. <laughs> that is a tiny water pistol. Look at the size of that. Pathetic, isn't it? Look, i tell you what, Scampi. Because I'm feeling so big-hearted, and because I would hate for you to feel homesick, you can do it. Go on. Come on, young man. Give it all you got. Come on. Matthew Corbett was a very unique children's TV presenter too. While most hosts would be your typical soft-spoken teacher figure, Matthew gave his television persona a more human depth. He could be erratic and anxious, cross and grumpy, but also gentle, loving and relaxed. There was an everyman appeal to him too. His character is a typical northerner with a sense of sarcasm. The perfect straight tank to play off a bunch of silly puppets. Kids love seeing hapless adults being wound up or humiliated for laughs. It's another note. Beware these premises are protected by anti-burglar devices. That dog has finally lost his marbles. These premises are not protected by anti-burglar devices. Ridiculous. I also enjoyed the chemistry between Matthew and Sooty. You see, Matthew himself puppeteers Sooty, so he's having to multitask between his own physical acting and the hand movements for Sooty. The way he does both at the same time is really impressive. Whether he's bouncing off Sooty in a cartoony comedy gag, or having to do different things at once. He'd been doing this franchise since the 70s, so it's no surprise that the shtick had become a natural instinct from at this point. Hey, this is very exciting. Our very first delivery. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, Sooty, whatever it is you've ordered, you certainly seem to have got uh, plenty of them. Uh, Sooty, come back here. Uh, what is it exactly? You're a bit busy. Uh, Sooty and Go is a pretty solid sitcom series that the whole family can enjoy together. It's instantly relatable, full of good laughs, and a great showcase for Matthew Corbett's talent. Captain Pugwash. This cartoon follows the sea adventures of Captain Pugwash and his crew. Now, don't expect a complex lore or serious world building in this nautical cartoon, because each episode is only four or five minutes long, with an emphasis on sketch-style comedy over serial storytelling. The charm of this show mainly comes from its adorable cut-out puppetry. While most puppet shows at the time went for felt or marionette, Captain Pugwash goes for a picture book aesthetic, making each episode feel like a short bedtime story for kids. The characters themselves may be swashbuckling buccaneers, but they're far from your typical pirates. Each of them have round, tubby designs, flamboyant voices, and campy mannerisms. Before One Piece and Dardman's pirates came along, Captain Pugwash was maybe the first cartoon to show pirates in a more friendly light. There's something almost harmless about these adorable fellas, from their quaint way of talking to the almost family-like relationship between the crew. Here's the spot, me hearties, where the good ship Dolphin was blown by a hurricane 50 years ago, tossed high on an iceberg, and there they say she lies, frozen forever in the polar wastes, with a great treasure of diamonds aboard, abandoned by her crew. That is our next expedition, lads, to the frozen north, to recover the lost diamonds of the Dolphin. The less like John Silver's gang of crooks out to violently plunder, and more like a bunch of old tea-sipping gentlemen who are playing pirates for fun. It's also usually the youngest crew member, Cabin Boy Tom, who saves the day, while the adults squirm and cower. The monster will chase the biscuits, and we put a tow rope on its tail. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, away we go, eh? <laughs> Excellent, Tom. Uh, only I think it would be better if uh, uh, you did the... Uh, uh... Oh no, Captain. I've got to keep the monster happy. With the concertina. While each episode is very, very, very short, there's some fun to come from never knowing the adventure ahead. It's a new obstacle every time, and the crew's bumbling approach to pirating makes their pitiful efforts really easy to sympathise with. Fire! <laughs> Suffering sardine pirate Willy, do you still not know the difference between gunpowder and pepper? Kids will enjoy this show very much because it's simple funny and quick. Plus, they'll appreciate the charm of the picture book puppetry and the wholesome appeal of the pirates themselves. So, those are all the TV shows I'm going to be talking about in this video. But like I said in the beginning, I will be doing another video on this topic in the future. I just can't say when. So, what am I going to be reviewing in the next episode of Puppet Panic? Well...
Cheerio, folks. <laughs> <laughs>